Okay, guys, hello. So we are in the last little piece of the reproduction lecture. We're going to talk about menopause and pregnancy. Okay, so when do you undergo menopause? When does it start? So you have to remember that in the OS, in the ovaries, for females, all of the eggs that you're ever going to have, you're born with them. You don't make more eggs through life. Okay, so they're going to be arrested in prophase one as the primary follicles, and they're just going to sit around there. And then some of them will be collect, you know, selected to undergo, you know, to start develop. Only one of those will be actually chosen to be ovulated. The rest of them will die off through a process called artesia. So most of them will be dying off, or a couple of them will be ovulated. But when you're done with them, you're done with them. There's no more left. Okay, so once you start going into menopause, it's because you're, you're out of eggs. Okay, so let's, the menopause is gonna, usually going to occur between 40 to 50. The, there are some environmental kind of influencers, for example, smoking, but usually it's um, really the best indicator when you might undergo menopause is when your mother went through menopause. So there is a definitely a genetic kind of connection and inherited connection there. Okay, so let's go through how this affects your body. So here you, here you are when you're born, you get all your follicles. And then as you get older and older, you're gonna lose, you know, you'll be using up the last of your follicles. And at the point where you have no follicles left, remember that those follicles, those are the cells surrounding the oocytes, the follicles, those produce estrogen. And so when you're out of follicles, what's going to happen to follicle stimulating hormone. So remember that when your estrogen levels decline, you also lose the negative inhibition of follicle stimulating hormone. And so the levels of follicle stimulating hormone are going to go up, okay, as well as luteinizing hormone. So you lost your negative inhibition and you, that the follicle stimulating hormone is going to go up. So what about progesterone? So remember that progesterone, it's secreted from the corpus luteum which is what's left over after ovulation. Well, if you don't have follicles and you're not ovulating, do you have a corpus luteum? No, you do not, okay? So the levels of progesterone are also going to decline. So you have a decline in estrogen, a decline in progesterone, and an increase in follicle stimulating hormone. Okay, so during menopause, especially during premenopause, so at the point where you're not quite there yet, but you're having some fluctuation, that is going to cause, uh, that can often cause irritability, and irritability is usually occur, uh, associated with the fluctuations of hormones in the brain, so the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, especially the hypothalamus, that can cause things like irritability. Usually by the time that it kind of levels off, that kind of goes away. Many of the symptoms are associated with the lack of estrogen. A big one is osteoporosis. So after menopause, your risk of osteoporosis goes way up. And the reason for that is because estrogen, remember, it's a, lip, it's a liposome. It's a sexual hormone. It's a steroid. And so it also has sex, you know, effects on the body, just like testosterone did. And one of the effects that the estrogen has is that it go, it, it increases the amount of calcium uptake in the bones, okay? So if you don't have estrogen, you'll have less calcium deposited into those bones. That's going to make them um, brittle because, you know, you won't have as much calcium, calcium matrix, and that can lead to osteoporosis. The other thing I wanted to point out is it also can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease because estrogen as a steroid means that it's made from cholesterol, which is a lipid. And if you don't take the, if you don't, if you're not taking the cholesterol to make estrogen from it, you're going to have more cholesterol. And so levels of cholesterol can go up. And when you have levels of cholesterol going up, that, that means that you can have more of those, lip, those low density lipoproteins, which can relate really to uh, atherosclerosis and heart attacks and strokes, and then, so general cardiovascular diseases too. Okay. That's enough of that. Let's talk about something more fun. Let's talk about pregnancy. 
Okay, so let's look at what happens with pregnancy. So the first thing that happens is the egg has to, sorry, the sperm has to penetrate the egg. And remember that it, the surrounding the egg, you have a bunch of follicular cells. And so what the, the sperm do is they have what's called an acrosome at the top of their the little head, the sperm head. And they, they secrete digestive enzymes that literally digest away at those cells. And then it's also going to um, kind of fuse with the, sorry, fuse with the uh, plasma membrane of the egg, of the secondary oocyte. And once it's penetrated, remember, that's when it can fully finish its second meiosis. And then, then, then they will come together to create the zygote. Usually this occurs in the uterine tube. So if you think about the pathway that it has to take, that means that the egg has, the sperm has to travel from the vagina, through the cervix, through the uterus, all the way into the uterine tube at the same time that the egg is traveling from the ovaries to the uterine tube and that's where they meet kind of in the middle. Okay, so it really is about chance of just getting the timing correct. Okay, so the other thing that has to happen is remember that when there's one sperm, there's probably tons of sperm all kind of racing each other to get in. So you really want to prevent polyspermy, which just means that you have more than one sperm fertilizing it. Because remember, if you have more than one sperm going in, you'll also have more than two sets of chromosomes. And that's not good. That's not viable. So instead what happens is once one sperm makes its way in, it's gonna trigger a whole series of chemical reactions that creates a fertilization membrane. And that fertilization membrane prevents and actually negatively repulses all of the other sperm and they can't get in. I have a wonderful video. I would really suggest that you watch it. If you go into my slides, you click on this link right here, you can actually watch eggs being fertilized by the sperm, and you can watch the fertilization membrane growing. I love this video. Okay, so once they are in, once they are fertilized, so the sperm penetrates the egg, and they underfinish, they finish undergoing meiosis two. They will then combine their genetic material to create a zygote. Okay, from there, they're going to undergo a bunch of small little, cell, um, small little phases of mitosis. Okay, so they'll make a bunch of little building blocks that'll create an embryo. So you'll get a blastocyst, then a morula, then a gastrula. And then that embryo is going to travel all the way to the, to the uterus and is going to embed itself in the endometrium of the uterus. Okay. So let's look, let's kind of tie that back into the ovarian cycle. So remember that the hypothalamus, it releases gonadotropin releasing hormone. It releases two gonadotropins. We have follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The follicle stimulating hormone is going to mature those follicles, make more follicular cells, which in turn produce estrogen. Estrogen then negatively inhibits follicle stimulating hormone. It also negatively inhibits gonadotropin releasing hormone to help maintain those lower levels of estrogen. Remember that the drop in follicle stimulating hormone that will uh, help select one single dominant follicle. That then um, does the role reversal. We then have the LH spike. The LH surge is what you, that's usually called. That really Dramatic increase in luteinizing hormone will trigger ovulation. The secondary oocyte will come out and be spat out into the cavity. Then what's left is called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum produces a different hormone, which is called progesterone, which helps thicken the endometrium and allows the egg to implant if it is fertilized. If not, the corpus luteum will degrade and then the endometrium will go away. So if the egg comes in contact with the sperm, that will then come together to form a zygote, which will become an embryo. And the embryo needs to maintain the pregnancy because it needs to make sure that that endometrium is kept nice and thick and ready for it to embed. And so it secretes a different hormone 
which is called human chorionic gonadotropin. So human chorionic gonadotropin. And that's released from the embryo itself. Okay, so from the embryo itself, and what it then does is it helps maintain the pregnancy by, and by maintaining that endometrium, allows it to continue to, to um, stay nice and thick so it can embed in it. And then once the, uh, once the embryo is fully embedded and it creates and it develops inside, um, a placenta will develop. And the placenta then is, um, produces progesterone, which helps finish off maintaining the pregnancy for the rest of the 40 weeks, okay? So remember the placenta itself produces progesterone to help maintain it. So because the human chorionic gonadotropin will only be made from, if an embryo is in present, you can use that during a pregnancy test, okay? So the way that this works is you pee on a stick, You've all heard of that. And it's, it'll then it'll absorb into the test. And what happens is you have a bunch of antibodies here. And these antibodies are specific for human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. They're going to be specific to it. And so if it's present, it will bind to them. And that will create a line, a color line. And so that's the way you can test for it because it's only going to be present if an embryo isn't present, okay? So it's a very effective, very reliable test. Okay, so once the embryo embeds, some of the fetal tissue will combine with the maternal tissue and to create the placenta. So a placenta really is a, co a combination of fetal and maternal um, tissues. And the primary function is to um, help help with the with the fetal su blood supply. So it's going to supply the fetus with nutrients and oxygen, remove the waste products. But the other thing that it does, again, remember, it produces the progesterone to help maintain the pregnancy, keep that endometrium nice and thick. And that's why you don't have menstruation during your pregnancy because you you know have a constant level of progesterone the whole time and that's how you keep your, your endometrium nice and thick and ready. Um, after birth, you're going to trigger a whole host of things that's gonna cause you to produce milk, but even during the pregnancy, you're going to have growth of the mammary glands, which are shown in purple right here. This is the um, areola and the nipple there. So you have the mammary glands here that they're going to fully develop once they are in the pregnancy. If you've never been pregnant, then your mammary glands are not fully developed yet. They don't fully develop until the pregnancy. And then what happens is during the labor, okay, so of the first birth, during the labor you have uh, the, the thing that causes the uterine contractions is very high levels of oxytocin. And oxytocin are, is then going to produce, going to go to the hypothalamus and cause the projection of prolactin. And prolactin is going to stimulate the mammary glands to produce the milk, prolactin as in lactate. And the, um, then from there, when the baby starts to suckle on it, that's going to cause a letdown, which is going to uh, have the smooth muscle in the gland contract and secrete the milk out. So the relationship between the prolactin and the oxytocin would be a positive feedback and that positive feedback loop starts from the high levels of oxytocin that are produced during the birth. So remember that prolactin, prolactin is going to be produced by the anterior pituitary. It'll be regulated by the hypothalamus. Okay, so you have those high levels of oxytocin that'll that'll be um, that'll stimulate the hypothalamus, which will then in turn stimulate prolactin. The prolactin then stimulates the mammary glands to produce to make the milk in the first place, 
And then the more suckling that the baby has, the more oxytocin, which will be produced from the hypothalamus. And then you just have more and more and more. So it's a very kind of elegant system so that the baby gets just as much milk as it needs. And so this is why it's very important if you are gonna breastfeed, which again is very highly recommended, you wanna start that breastfeeding as soon as possible so that you can start that suckling, which you get the oxytocin. So you can establish that very healthy, positive feedback loop so that the baby gets as much milk as it needs. Um, if you wait or if you don't feed often enough, you're not going to get enough oxytocin. And if you don't have enough oxytocin, then you won't have that prolactin. Okay, so start it strong right at the beginning as much as you can and make sure you have regular feedings or regular suckling sessions or at least pumping sessions to keep your milk supply up. Okay, so what was the function of that placenta? Well, it's the blood supply for the fetus, and so it's going to provide nutrients and oxygen. It also removes the waste products there, carbon dioxide, urea, that kind of stuff. And it also is going to secrete progesterone to help maintain the pregnancy, keep that endometrium nice and thick so that you don't have menstruation during the pregnancy. Okay, so I really, really strongly suggest that you go ahead and take and just write all this out. So create a cause and effect diagram where you have one event triggering a second event and continue on that way because um, sometimes it can get kind of overwhelming looking at all of the material at once and so you really want to think of this as a story with a specific sequence of events. So something causes something else causes something else. Okay, bye.